Hello, everyone. I have a distinguished guest to interview today. She is a game designer and an artist with an extensive resume that would make any nerd drool. She's worked for a number of big hitters, including no less than the original TSR in its heyday, Steve Jackson Games, and id Software. There's a very good chance that you in your nerdy media consumption throughout your life have at some point been influenced by her. Her current base of operations is Dragon Girl Studios. That's Dragon Girl, one word. Uh, please welcome Janelle Jaquez. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Bill. It is great to be here. Yeah, Thank it, you for inviting me. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, like I said, you have a multifaceted career. Of course, I'm going to hone in on D&D &D stuff, and that's how you're one of my heroes. But, uh, <laughs> um, of course, Caverns of Thracia is, is how I learned of you, but um, it's been uh, great to, to learn more about you. So I uh, just wanted to pick your brain a little bit here tonight. I'll start off with the cliche question. The D&D Edition Wars happened, continue to happen. Where are you on editions? Well, I began my gamer life in the 70s. So my home edition is OD&D. The original Dungeons and Dragons white box with Greyhawk and a couple of the other um, the accessories that came along with it. Kind of shifted over to AD&D and then other than actually working on second edition, I went away from the edition wars until 5e, which I'm still trying to figure out. Gotcha. All right, so uh, do you still play D&D &D much? And if so, is it OD&D? &D? No, I rarely play. When I'm playing these days, um, I'm going to get back into it, I hope. Uh -huh. um, but my game of choice is um, Matt Finch's Swords and Wizardry because it simulates that OD&D &D, OD &D experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. And are you usually a, a DM or game master or a player? My usual role is game master, DM. Uh -huh. And do you enjoy that more than being a player? Yeah, I do. I, I like, I like enter, I'm an entertainer. I enjoy entertaining other people and my media is games. Mm -hmm. you, I don't know about you, but on the rare occasions I am a player, it is hard not to start to dictate some things and come do you do you have that challenge um you know start not to so, not so much well i know as a dm i'm sitting here wanting to hit hint to the players to play better but um no i usually don't i just shut my mouth and let other people make mistakes ah that that's good, good on you that's good um all right so uh let's talk about your artist side as an artist uh, what's your preferred media these days, my preferred media is digital. Uh -huh. um, I use a software that helps me recreate the way I used to work back in my early career in black and white. So that's that is my preferred media. If you like want to go Wacom tablet or I have a I have a um, Wacom Cintiq. Wacom and okay. I use uh, Clip Studio uh, Clip Studio Paint is my uh -huh. software of choice. Okay. With, um, with assistance by Photoshop. All right. Gotcha. All right. So you're rolling with the times. Cool. Um, uh, now, as far as art goes, so on my channel, I do um, like amateur miniature terrain stuff to enhance role, my role playing games and my war games. Do you do any of that? I do. That's kind of how I got to know who you are. Um, okay. When I got in. About five, ten, about let me see, 2016 maybe. Okay. I started getting into doing um, miniatures painting again, and I wanted to do terrain. So I made. Um, I was looking at who was doing the best terrain tiles, and I found this guy with this lilacs armory oh. uh, site, and I liked what you were doing, mm. and so that was the ones I imitated, and so I've been doing. Oh. I'm, I made my own set, and then I then when uh, 3D printing came along, I figured out how to make my own set of 3D that emulated that. Okay, so you've learned some 3D modeling. Well, I I was in the 
computer game industry in the early 2000s and you you oh, don't certainly. not learn some modeling right yeah 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 so that was uh obviously not just id software but you you were a level designer on quake yes uh quake 2 and quake 3 uh-huh yeah so <laughs> that that's a pretty huge deal t to me at least like that that is full-time celebrity stuff what, what was your time at id like um it was challenging uh because i went from being an illustrator at tsr in 97 to becoming a level designer um just as things were shutting down well i, I skipped out of tsr just ahead of the first person showing up to talk about buying uh, wizards of the coast buying it so I missed all that, um, but it was challenging. Um, it was kind of a crazy place to work. A uh, very small team, mm -hmm. very small. It's it was I think it, we maxed out at thirteen people working on the games, and that included uh, the office manager. So were you like routinely around Romero and Carmack and? Um, I came in after Romero left. Okay. Um, and so you work around John Carmack, but you don't necessarily work with him. Uh huh. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and what were were there any principles in designing levels for a three D a first person shooter, which really has no like developmental or RPG, or, or maybe it does, and you can educate me. But was there any principles you took from your former career to there, and then after oh, yeah. in software to what you're doing now? Well, I went from, I went, I would, uh, let me start over here. When I worked at, um, at uh, TSR in the late 90s, I was an illustrator. I wasn't doing any design. And I got interested in the idea of doing 3D design for games. And that's kind of what intrigued me to go to work for id when they offered, when they uh, recruited me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there is quite a bit. Um, a lot of the same principles design uh, crossover. Uh, the biggest being variety of experience. Um, learning that you want to break up visuals, you want to encourage exploration. Those all transfer. Yeah, as, so encouraging exploration. Um, I, I just had a note here that it, this is sort of a generality, which is dangerous, but in general, game design across all genres has moved more toward linear linearity. It seems mm -hmm. you know, look at Skyrim compared to Morrowind or um, it's, things are getting, for lack of a better word, a little bit simplified and more instant reward. You could contrast it with what you just said and like a Quake 2 level, which is certainly not linear. Um, Caverns of Thracia, which has three entrances. Uh, what's your stance on that trend? Um, it's understandable that very product with very expensive assets and a complicated uh, design pipeline is going to want to create a um, product that everyone gets to see. One of the issues with nonlinearity is that you may create content that no one sees or no one sees on a regular basis. Um, so what's good for fun and play may not be good for budget. Uh, so the approach is, is going to go more linear. And it's gonna, I think that will be involved both in tabletop and in, um, in video games, is you want to get the most bang out of the very expensive assets that you create mm -hmm. um, rather than have this entire awesome area of a game that no one ever sees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, as an artist, um, right now I'm working on my own uh, cyberpunk system and I've hired a couple artists um, and they're just fantastic to work with. And it's really cool how I can give them the more detailed a prompt I give them, they produce a product that's like, wow, they're just, it's like my mind is a paintbrush and they're miracle workers. But what is your stance on AI art? I have mine, I'll reserve it, but. Well, my stance is no, mm. not, not for commercial work. Um, the current state of AI is theft. 
Um, it, it takes existing work and made by artists who may have had no say in whether or not their work was used to train an AI system and to creates product that might as well be a variation on their work. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to say when I produce product, there will be no AI in it. It will all be the product of human minds and hands. Yeah, I saw floating around some users group. Someone came up with a logo, like a, a proudly no AI something stamp. And they, they were like, hey, start putting well, this in your indie products. And I, I think I'm put that in, I'm going to put that in mine. My current project, um, a while back, somebody, I saw someone did a no AI. It was not the one you're talking about. And it is going to go, it is in my book. And I actually also credit the designer of the logo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will confess before I run a game, I'm prepping for an hour and I want to give my folks a, an idea of something that that I'm thinking of. I'll use that just for my home game from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've also polled my audience to see if they think there's harm in that. And a very small percentage do think that there's some harm in that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, interesting trend. Hey, Dragon Dice. Dragon Dice. Lost to time. I had a summer where it was my life. Just talk about Dragon Dice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, what happened? I can tell the story of my involvement with Dragon Dice, which still isn't really over. Um, go back to 1995, January 1995. Um, my boss at TSR was the head of graphics, and because he knew me through my work at Coleco, where I was a department manager, he asked if I would step in as manager of the graphics group. So I thought through it, um, being the kind of person who was already bored with painting book covers every month, um, I stepped into that role. And the first project that literally got handed to me was the creation of Dragon Dice. I was not involved in the packaging, but what I worked on was I coordinated the team that created all the icons and did about half of them myself. Um, I did the Lava Elf and the, I think I did it in the Dwarf. I did the Lava Elf and the Dwarf races initially, and then most of the rest of the races throughout the product I either did them or had a hand in designing how they looked, including right up until last year when I did a new race for the people who are now publishing Dragon Dice uh, called the Dracolum. Yeah, I know it still it still exists. I've just never met another person who uh, has played it or even has heard of it. Is is there localized sections that are thriving? Do you know how big is it um, still? It's, it's a fairly focused hobby. Um, mm -hmm. The guys who run it, they show up at the major and regional cons. Um, they're still a going concern. They run Kickstarters to either restock or make new dice. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a fandom. They are active. They're just not huge. Yeah, I, which I don't understand. I, I think it was just so far ahead of its time. I, in today's world where indie games are, are blowing up and the euro game scene where complexity is good is a thing and the dice are just works of art in and of themselves they're so <laughs> thank you collectible even if you don't play them they're just gorgeous well, one of the one of the cool things that's going on kind of at the side lester smith who was the original designer assistant designer for dragon dice back at tsr he's been working on a role-playing game that uses the dragon dice hmm. integrates them in mm -hmm. i see okay neat all right um could you talk about exactly what your footstep into tsr was how you got that original license for the dungeoneer like there was no internet uh, and there's no kickstarter or anything like you were bootstrapping exactly what <laughs> transpired how did you do that well, let's go back to, I'll tell the or, my origin story in games and then yeah. go forward oh, yeah. that. Um, 1975, October, 
uh, I'm working at my college radio station as an announcer. My younger brother, who is actually the gamer in the family, um, called me on the phone at work and said, hey, I just got this magazine and there's this these reviews in there for this interesting uh, game that I think you'll like. And he read over the phone these two sh very short reviews of Dungeons and Dragons that appeared in the Space Gamer issue number two. I listened to what he was saying, and it, I could almost literally feel my life pivoting and changing and going in a new direction at that mm. point. So once I got my hands on, on the magazine, my brother lived two miles away, um, I ordered this the dragon the D, D set and greyhawk and chainmail mm -hmm. and waited for them with bated breath to come well the first thing that came was um greyhawk and chainmail that was my exposure to what D, &D was like mm -hmm. and so i had a totally wrong idea <laughs> of what the game was because from those two products mm -hmm. the actual white box was back ordered and it wouldn't be until um, January, February of 1976, because um, school breaks and then a uh, Europe trip and then back at school where my friends had already snagged the box out of my mailbox at school um, and started playing themselves, or at least started reading the rules. That's when we started actually being able to play. And we there was um, a very small hand of it handful of us who were playing mostly on my dorm floor um and we were to be understand we were also at a very small christian evangelical christian college in the midwest mm -hmm. so nobody knew what we understood what we were doing at mm -hmm. that point we were just a bunch of fantasy fans figuring out how to make games well being a creative person and having a graphics design background already i was an art major I had done work on school newspapers, college newspapers, so I knew how to do pre-press production that, the way it was done back in the mid-70s. So I said, hey, why don't we see about, um, no one's making stuff for D&D out there, maybe we could make our own and put out a fan magazine based on it. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple, two of my friends, Mark and Merle, and we decided, yeah, we'll do that. Well, I was already getting um, stuff from TSR at that point. Um, I think I had subscribed to their their um, their magazine that later became The Dragon. And I wrote a letter to Tim Cask because he was the editor. And I said, hey, if we produce a fan magazine called The Dungeoneer, are we stepping on your trademarks or rights in any way? Tim wrote me a postcard back and said, nope, not at all. Um, just make sure you don't include lots of our content in your magazine. And that's how we got permission. It, you know, you said there was no internet, but we had the mail and we sent postcards yeah. to each other. Receipts. I actually, Original I OGL. <laughs> so that's how that started. Um, we started trying to figure out what kind of content would be in it. Um, I came up with the idea that, hey, let's let's put an adventure in the magazine and we'll also do things like new monsters, new magic items. And Mark wrote a short uh, in a installment based story. And we all, we, we all contributed to it. And then um, I did the production where my friend Mark had a select, not a selective typewriter, but a, a typewriter with a film ribbon in it, carbon film ribbon. So I would do, go through and type up the co the article in columns and then go back through and figure out how I would justify it by adding spaces in between the words. Mm -hmm. Then retype it on his carbon film, which gave it a really nice, clean, um, clean edged look. Then we paste those up on big sheets of paper and take them off to the printer. That summer, um, we got the first magazine ready to go. It was uh, June 1976. And by the time we got the printer, they got about 200 issues back from the printer. Um, we decided we had been researching, well, how do we get this into gamers' hands? 
And the way we did that was is we kind of skimmed magazines and um, bulletin boards and found places that people had been posting their address, say they were looking wow. for players. Gorilla. They weren't all, yeah, they wow. weren't necessarily all D and D players, and we found out that had its own side effect later. But we just sent out a hundred free copies. Now the positive side is that James M. Ward of TSR was our first subscriber. Hmm. But he's the guy who created Metamorphosis Alpha. Okay. Um, and then um, we also got letters back from people who were really mad at us for sending this to them and said, never do this again. D&D is, is destroying the tabletop gaming hobby. So we never sent them anything again. Hmm. Okay. Wow. So that was just brute force finding people, soliciting. Wow. That is impressive. And then we eventually ended up, um, it got word of mouth out there and we actually started selling them to hobby shops around, literally around the world. Very cool. Wow. All but right. that was, that was my step into being um, doing work uh, in the game industry. Um, about a year and a half later, it was the end of 1978 mm -hmm. and we were all either trying to graduate or had graduated and it was getting very difficult to work on the magazine. So I ended up selling it to someone. Hmm. Okay. But that you wrote a letter. Ultimately, I that's how it started. That's wow, how it cool. started. Cool. And it, it, again, I, I know that you've done a ton other than D and D, but to harp on it, do you have a favorite D and D module? Or campaign set product, I'll say D and D product. Not really, because this may sound surprising. I never played any of the modules. Okay. Um, everything we did was pretty much homebrew. It wasn't necessarily because um, we didn't respect or like them. It's just that by the time they started, for my college group, by the time they started coming out. Um, we were already out of school and broke ex-college students. Um, I was working for Judges Guild, um, and we we're trying, you know, trying to put together a new game group. And we even had moved on from we even had moved on from playing D and D. We were playing a uh, new game system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are you familiar with a film called Finding Forrester with Sean Connery? Yeah, it's the one where the reclusive author lives in a flat, big book-lined flat in the city, and some kid decides to create, try to reach out to him. Yes, I've seen the movie. Right. Yeah. So uh, once he befriends him, there's a point where Sean Connery is, uh, he's sort of not, for lack of a better word, confused about how, to this day, people are taking his book and dissecting it and trying to figure out what he was really trying to say, when he was really just writing a book that that mm -hmm. was his sentiment in our pre-chat that's kind of the vibe i got from you about caverns of thracia there's an article on the alexandrian.net it's like a six-part article dissecting the game design theory behind that module that you wrote and all mm -hmm. these charts and stuff uh, and you said you were pretty surprised by it because it you didn't actually think of any of that you just it was just me intuitive kind of trying to create interesting play spaces yeah. with um, various uh, ideas of what would make an interesting play space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I thought that was, that was humorous. Um, are there any particular products over the years that you're most proud to have had a part in? Okay. From a and b standpoint. Um, any standpoint. Okay, then I'll, I'll go over a few of them. Um, one in the late 80s, well, let's see, let's go to the City Book line. Um, this is Flying Buffalo, it was doing a line of books that were generic city establishments. I contributed to the third one as an author, and then they came back, or Rick Loomis, the head of uh, FBI, Flying Buffalo at the time came to me and said, would you be interested in taking over the production on the line? And it sounded like an interesting project, so I did. 
It was a lot of work, but we I produced uh, over the course of about three or four years. I produced um, three books, uh, volumes four, five, and six of city establishments where I didn't write the whole thing, but I coordinated the efforts of a whole bunch of authors um, to get uh, to, to create these three establishments. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Um, ColecoVision. Um, I was not the designer of the system, but I was the team leader, manager, eventually create director over the designers who produced all the games at Coleco for the ColecoVision. I'm still very proud of that. Um, let's see, keep going forward. Uh, yeah. Catacombs and what's it called? Campaign and Catacomb Guide for TSR. Um, it was supposed to be about 54 pages inside the second edition DMG. Along the way, it got cut and became its own product. Hmm. So, very proud of that. Um, let's go forward to sometime later. Um, I worked and went to work for id Software for five years after TSR, and then I went to Ensemble Studios in Dallas, where I worked on Age of Empires 3 and Halo Wars. Mm -hmm. But there was the expansion pack for Age of Empires 3 called the War Chiefs. That is the favorite pro my favorite project ever having worked on. Mm. Um, it just was a small project, a small team, and it came together under deadline under budget and we got more into it than we had actually planned to put in it because we were really committed to making it good and then finally um there's a school here in the dallas area uh, at southern methodist university called the guild hall it is a graduate level program for making how to make computer and video games um, I'm one of the founders of that school. Um, I helped write the curriculum, the original curriculum for it. And my son is a graduate of it. So that's probably one of the things I'm really proud of. And I think it's the first time my dad really was impressed by what I did for a living. <laughs> I told you everyone, nerd royalty here. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that uh, you've touched on it a few times here tonight that some of your experiences are more in just management and leadership, not really so much in about the content creation, but you've been in roles where you're just facilitating well, a team. There's always been a creative directory, a creative aspect to that management. Um, okay. While I would bring people together to work together. In fact, that's, that's what a book producer, a book packager does. Mm -hmm. I'm doing that right now on my current project. You bring people together who have the skills to do and create a project and you guide them to create the best product possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that at Coleco. I did that for a while at um, TSR. Uh, I did it again at um, my last job in the full time job in the video game industry at CCP working on the World of Darkness MMO where I ended up becoming lead level designer on it. Mm -hmm. so yeah it's there it's you you create using other hands it's the best way to put it to, to steal a cliche you, you play the orchestra yes right? yeah okay um do a speed round here what's your favorite movie um ghostbusters original okay favorite tv show um a whole bunch of them recently. Uh, I really enjoyed enjoyed Owl House, um, The Mandalorian. Um, <laughs> Haven't heard of Owl House, but oh, all right, Mandalorian. Disney, check out, check it out on Disney. Okay, will do. Noted. Uh, favorite food? Somewhere between pizza and popcorn. Wow, that's quite a gap. Well, I, I like pizza. I like popcorn. <laughs> Okay. If I need if I need a comfort food, it's popcorn. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. My wife too. Uh, favorite book. Favorite book. Um, 
let's say fiction, favorite fiction. Okay, I used to read, one of my favorite books as a kid was called Tunnel in the Sky. And the whole idea was, behind it was, kids are thrown into a, kind of a Swiss Family Robinson situation on another planet. It's by Robert Heinlein, it's part of his juvenile series. Mm. I, I always go back to that. But if I'm going to set another series, it's um, the Garrett Chronicles, which is okay. it's more recent, um, but it's basically a hard-boiled fantasy detective, or hard-boiled detective set in the fantasy world. Um, hmm. I, oh, I have heard of that, but nothing more than what you just said. All right. Yeah, it's it's... It originally, it used to, started out just pot boiler, kind of always came back to the same point, no character development, but by the end of the series, he started actually becoming a real person, hmm. um, developing, changing, um, gotcha. moving forward the way real people do. Okay. All right. Uh, metal or plastic dice? Plastic. And what color? Uh, rainbow dice are my favorite right now, but um, yeah. I know that they were rolling badly for me in the game recently, so they're in the Hall of Shame right now. Yeah, yeah. Hot plate. Okay, uh, let's see. Do you have a favorite board game? Are you much into board games? Um, right now, I'll say a twist between... I've been playing Hero Quest, the Milton Bradley... Um, not the Milton Bradley version, but the, uh, the Hasbro version. Mm -hmm. um, I also like horrified which is a really simple board game from ravensburger where it's a cooperative board cooperative play against the universal pictures monsters ah okay the world of darkness nice well no it's actually it's actually yeah sort of it's not related to that but it's um well not not the uh not the white wolf world of darkness but what what universal studios calls the you're saying then, okay, frankenstein yeah, dracula was, the classics yep. right Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. It's All right. Uh, quick game. Favorite video game that you had no part of? Pirate. Sid Meier's Pirates. Oh, that's a deep cut. Interesting. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, now, tell us about central casting. All right. Another, let's go back into the past. Um, when I was in college, and we were starting to role play game. I started putting together a background set of background tables for my the people who played in the games or in the games I played in. Roll dice, come up with events that happened in your life. It's a, a life path um, character creation system. And by the time I was done with college, I'd written it up to about 15 pages worth of uh, type pages. It got published in a in a copy of the Dungeoneer when it was the Dungeoneer was produced by Judges Guild. And then I was out of the game industry for a number or the video or the tabletop game industry for a number of years. When I came back into it, I was looking for projects that I could do and maybe own. Um, and I started recreating central casting. I recreated this history product as central casting, which is roll, roll dice, create a backstory for a character using tables and the original was published by task force games in 1988 and i did a science fiction version afterwards and one for modern role play and then i kind of left the game industry <laughs> the tabletop game industry again for quite a number of years now that i'm kind of semi-retired um semi-retired in the fact that you know i only work 60 hours a week on this stuff um, I said, okay, I'm going to, I want to bring back this book. I got a lot of people, demands from people to, or requests pleading to bring it back into print because the publisher went out of business and they're, they're just, any, everybody's copies were disintegrating. So I started working on it about five years ago and I gave myself no limits on what I was going to write, which was the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes or whatever in my life. It took me five years four and a half years to write the book or three and a half years to write the book a year to edit it first pass and then since last fall i've been um, prepping it for production but it's a a massive um system for creating a 
background histories for characters um, from birth to whenever you decide to either start role playing them or include them in a novel. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And uh, you've been demoing it, right? You took it uh, just over this past weekend. Yep, I've been showing it off to people mainly because people want to see where it's at. Um, I wish I wish I could say I did more demoing of it, but mostly I ended up uh, playing Hero Quest with players and just talking to people who wanted to talk. Good for you, I say. Um, is the the best place for folks to follow you your Dragon Girls Studios uh, Facebook page or? Um, Probably for, for people who are not my close personal friends, um, I would recommend following me on my professional account on Facebook. It's uh, Janelle Jakeways dot artist, something like that. But okay. search my name and you'll find one that's a personal account and the other that um, is a professional account. One has a cartoon that's per personal, the other has a pic photograph that's professional. Gotcha. And okay. I and I talk about what I'm doing there. Okay. Um, Very good. Oh, go ahead. I would say Dragon Girl tends to be mostly just what I'm doing as an artist these days, which isn't a lot. I see. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, besides central casting, do you have any other things on the horizon, or it's your sole focus yeah. right now? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, once. Once I get this this monster out the door, um, I have a 5e adventure that I wrote a couple years ago and had people blind test for me. I need to do a couple tweaks to that and I will get that out there. And then stepping behind that um, are some uh, Swords and Wizardry adventures that I had started a while back, uh, kind of like Mega Dungeons, um, that I want to go back to and finish developing them. Gotcha. Sorry, I'm just taking notes here. That's okay. <laughs> Gotta check out all these things you've recommended. So, all right, uh, cool. Well, um, anything else you'd like to discuss or plug or anything for us? Well, I don't know if, when you're going to release this, but if you're in the Dallas area, um, I will be speaking at a vintage computer expo in Dallas on the weekend of the 23rd and the 24th, actually the 24th, um, talking about my time at Coleco. Uh, I call it, it's basically a view of Coleco from the trenches. Cool. All right. Yeah. So that's, that's June 23rd. Yes. June 23rd, 24th. 24th. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 24th. Yeah. We'll get it out in time. So folks can come learn about you. All right. Well, uh, Janelle, thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. That's been oh, you're welcome. great to meet you. Um, I'm, I'm 38, so I wasn't there from the beginning, but I love <laughs> to uh, to hear about where the hobby was really born. And um, and folks like yourself are just a gold mine of, of interesting information. So thank you so much. You're quite welcome. All right. Uh, would, would you say it for me? Uh, make, make things play games. Oh, uh, make things and play games. Amen. <laughs>